Hello, I'm Tom Bailey, and in today's Speaker Stories episode, I'll be getting to know Daryl Stinson, who is an international speaker, best-selling author, credential minister, award-winning philanthropist, and two times TEDx speaker, as well as the founder of Second Chance Athletes. So, Daryl, hello, and a very warm welcome to today's episode. What's up, what's up, what's up, man? It's going to be an epic episode, I can already tell. It is. Thank you so much for being here. And just out of interest for everyone listening, whereabouts in the world are you right now? I'm in Metro ATL, baby. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing. Now, I already mentioned you're a two times TEDx speaker, and I happen to know that one of those talks has had over two million views. So that's where I wanted to start today. How does it feel knowing that you've potentially impacted the lives of at least two million people, as well as all the other work you've been doing? Surreal. You know, yeah. um, there was, I mean, I, you know, I, my, I would have never thought that that is how I would have impacted people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, my journey that I was a, an elite athlete. And so I thought that was how I was going to get fame and influence was yeah, through my athletic ability, but to do it through a place that was a huge insecurity for me, which was my voice has mm -hmm. been un, unreal, absolutely unreal. Really interesting that you talked about that that huge insecurity. Uh, some of the speakers that I talked to we always knew they were going to be natural born speakers. Others have had different journeys. So let's go right back to the beginning. What, what was your kind of earliest memory of having to stand up and speak in front of an audience? Um, man, I kind of was a natural at growing mm -hmm. up, you know, like I can remember being in like class and being very charismatic, mm -hmm. very outspoken until um, I was walking in the hallway and I saw a group of black students in my school circle together, you know, cracking up, making jokes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, being charismatic, I'm like, I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna like make some jokes too. And I go over to them, I'm like, what's so funny? And one of them turned towards me and said, You're was funny, white boy. And they all laughed. And that's when I learned that I was known in our school as the black kid that quote unquote talks and acts white. Okay. And so it created this level of insecurity in myself because I said who I am authentically isn't enough to be liked or loved by other people. Mm. And so while I was kind of more of a born natural communicator and leader, I very much so learned how to become insecure and dim that light. And, you know, I feel like all of us are like that. Like I've never met a kid who wasn't vibrant and playful but it's because of these experiences and these rejections and these social moments where they weren't accepted for who they really were, that they start to question their identity and their voice and start to dim their light a little bit. And that was my case. Yeah, I can really resonate with that story from myself as well. There are specific memories I can remember as well where my light was dimmed. So I guess, what what did that look like? How did that play out then as you came out of school, went to you know university, early career? How did that kind of insecurity play out when it came to standing up or speaking in front of audiences? Well, you know, I, I continued in the projection of being someone that I wasn't because in my mind, not that it was truth, but it was something I was telling myself was truth, was that it was safer to be someone else than it was to be myself. Mm -hmm. And so when I would stand up in front of the room, I would be someone I'm not, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I would, you know, say what I think I'm supposed to say in front of yeah. people, you know, I would act how I'm supposed to think I'm supposed to act in front of people and you know, I was caging my authentic personality, my authentic beliefs, and who I really was on the inside. And so um, a lot of times, man, I would try to avoid those scenarios as much as possible. Like I tell people all the time, I used to, when, you, you ever heard of icebreakers? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, like you go around the room, like, what's your name and your favorite, like spirit animal or whatever. So I used to uh, fake like I had to go to the bathroom and leave the room so that they would skip over me and I wouldn't have to speak in front of people. Yeah. And so whenever I was forced to, I mean, I have video footage, even of some early days of me speaking, um, you could see me like terrible eye contact, looking at my feet. You can see my hand shaking. Like you probably can't see that I'm sweating profusely, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you can see the nervousness. And um, I would mumble a lot because I didn't want to be heard because I had this subconscious belief that my voice didn't matter. My opinion didn't matter. So I would mumble a lot. You couldn't really hear what I was saying and I wouldn't speak up. And I certainly did not open up and take up my space with my body. Yeah. 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 Loads and loads and loads of that I, I resonate with. So um, 
I used to always say that, you know, I spent the first 30 years of my life becoming an expert at avoiding public speaking. <laughs> and I think it's very much like you. And and that I remember that circle of death, I used to call it, you know, people took it in turns going around the room, waiting to hear from, from you. And I'd be shaking, sweating, going bright red before you even got to me. So definitely can understand that. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like you were in, you know, a, a pretty inauthentic place when it came to speaking and avoiding it in most cases what what how did you go from from that to international <laughs> award-winning speaker <laughs> two times tedx speaker What's that journey you, like? i know such stark contrast right um well i had an awakening a spiritual awakening man um you know i uh, uh became suicidal because um i had pretended to be myself um, I had pretended to be someone I wasn't for so long that I lost sight of who I really was. Mm -hmm. And I was hiding, um, masking a lot of that with athletic success. Yeah. And so when I had a back injury that ended my opportunity to play in the NFL, um, I was forced to face, was I, you know, the real me that I couldn't even contextualize. Mm -hmm. And so I got, I got depressed, you know, suicidal, I ended up in a psychiatric care facility and it was there, man. I just had a spiritual awakening. Um, I found my faith and I, and I started to have this hope that man, man, like I'm here for a reason. Yeah. Like, like, and it was not sports. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like there's still a reason for me to be on this planet. And I think deep within myself, I knew like intuitively that I had sort of what I would call a calling to speak. Yeah. Um, you know, internally I felt it and externally I would get asked, you know, what happened to you? You know, like share your story, man. It would be really good for people to hear from you. You should speak to your former high school, like that type of thing. And so I was getting that uh, external feedback as well and those opportunities and I was shutting them all down. Like, Oh, I'm not a speaker. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, <laughs> like you talk about 30 years avoiding it. Mm -hmm. Um, And what happened is I, a, I embraced the process. Okay. I did it afraid. And when I say I did it afraid, I mean, one of my first speeches, I wrote out wrote word for word. Yeah. recited into a recorder yeah. okay mm -hmm. strong headphones up into my uh you know my jacket left one earphone in to give the appearance that i forgot to take my headphones out yeah press play and then proceeded to recite the recording okay terrible i started to repeat sentences because i talk a lot faster than i read mm -hmm. and it was one of the most embarrassing engagements i've done but i did it afraid good okay yeah. um i started to test the waters um you know things that i were afraid to do i started to do so if I was afraid to speak up a little bit in speeches, I started to like speak up a little bit, test the edges, see what that feels like. If I was afraid to do an illustration, I tried to do an illustration, right? Like I did this talk mm -hmm. called custom tailored for your purpose. And I was talking about how your purpose is only made for you. And I uh, tried on my wife's pants that yeah. <laughs> were like two <laughs> sizes too big, you yeah. know, too small for me. And, you know, I was willing to push my edge and that made me more comfortable with the uncomfort. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so many great messages in there, but but doing it afraid, doing it uncomfortable, uh, embracing the the journey. I think that's yeah. one of the big ones in there. And um, so so was it was the first one then going back to your previous school? Is that where you really started this this journey? Oh man, I can't remember what like the first one was. It was either it wasn't my it was probably my current school that I was at. So um, I was done playing football in college as a junior. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, after, you know, I survived the suicide attempt, I still had my senior year to play out. So I think I went back and did like a, I don't know, motivational message or something for the team. Yeah. It probably wasn't very right. motivational, but yeah. that was like the first. And then after that, probably churches and then youth camps and stuff like mm. that. Yeah. And and from that kind of um, first talk back in your senior year to now, how long was, how long has that journey been? So you don't want to give away your age or anything, but. Yeah. I mean, it's been about what, 10, 13 years, um, yeah. since, since then. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> I'm 33 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of people think I'm 40 or something. Cause yeah. I talk <laughs> like I'm super wise. Yeah. I just been through a lot, man. Yeah. Um, it's been excruciatingly beautiful. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Like painful, scary. Um, you know, I'm actually getting ready to do my third TEDx talk and it's going to be around how vulnerable speaking can change your life. Awesome. And, um, part of the thing that I said in doing this is, you know, you have to speak to a level of vulnerability that you hit your threshold. 
you know, if like if you imagine being in therapy and they're like, hey, tell me about your life. And you're just kind of like talking about your day, surface level stuff. Mm -hmm. Like you're really not going to get to the core of where you're stuck emotionally. Yeah. It's the same in speaking and growing personally. Like you have to communicate vulnerably enough. And by the way, vulnerability is not just your trauma. It's also your gifts. It's also your light. Like I think one of the most vulnerable displays of speaking was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Mm. Right. He didn't talk about the trauma. He said, I have a dream. Mm. That was very vulnerable in front of yeah. people who who could harm him. And yeah. so I, I have to say that because, you know, um, vulnerability is not just you talking about your trauma. It's also you talking about your light, your gift, your love, your personality, like letting all of you be seen by the world. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would do that. And wherever I would feel stuck or emotional spikes or resistance within my body, when I would kind of push that vulnerable edge, that was the area I knew that I could grow from. Okay. It was always scary because I it was out there for people to see. And I'm like checking the comments, you know, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I want to delete the videos and all yeah. that stuff. So that's what that was excruciating. But the beautiful part was what was on the other side of that vulnerability. Okay. Yeah. And that's what the process has been like for me. I think exploring the edges is is powerful. Never really thought about that before. Um, but you know, I feel like a lot of people I speak to, um, they may be reading books on public speaking, they may be watching videos, they're watching TED Talks, but there's only so far you can go from, from you know, developing your speaking journey. You have to test the edges, like you say. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Uh, mastering mechanics will never make you a world-class speaker. Mm. Yeah. Okay. You have to be in the work. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And if you master mechanics, you can get to a level where you sound professional and you sound poised and you can put on a really good show. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you'll make a really big impact. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. And so I guess, yeah, you know, go out there, test the edges, but also know that it's going to take time. You know, some of these aspiring speakers watch these world-class speakers thinking, oh, I can do that, you know, ne next year, this time next year, that'll be me. Um, but you know, it will be if you start today. Yeah. This time next year, it will be you. If you mm -hmm. start today, if you start today. Yeah. You have to start, start today. today. Mm. Just start and make a commitment yeah. of consistency. You know, it doesn't have to be every day, but consistency, majority of the time, more times than not, I'm going to like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to step into it. I'm going to try. And one of the things that helped me is to reframe how I viewed public speaking. Mm -hmm. To me, early on, it was all about the stage, the lights, the microphone. As I started to grow, I realized any time that I'm expressing my truth, any time where I'm sharing my beliefs, whether that's on stage, whether that's in conversation, whether it's on podcast, whether that's with my wife, my kids, like I'm speaking, mm -hmm. I'm expressing me. Yeah. And so if I start to see that, well, I can go where there's ease, right? Like I don't have to go speak in front of a crowd of 500 people to prove myself. Mm -hmm. I can start with like, hey, let me try to have an honest conversation with my spouse. Yeah. See how I do there. Yeah. Because how you do anything is how you do everything. Yeah. Yeah. Love. I love all of this. You know, I, I could, listen, I could talk to you all day. Um, <laughs> I guess one thing that I like to to ask speakers is, is that transition point. So you're probably doing a lot of free speaking, you know, you're speaking in front of your school and colleges and local groups. At, at some point you must've realized, you know what, I could make this into a career. I could get paid to do this. What What was that point like for you? And how did you, how did you navigate? This it? might make you upset. I didn't have to go through that. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah. And that, and it's so funny. And I don't think people do either, by the way. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I work yeah. with speakers and like, we can, you know, it. you get paid based upon value. Yeah. A lot of times, even that shift of when I started. So the, the only thing I can say that relates to that is when I started to quote higher prices. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so I didn't go like free, free, free. Now I'm charging, but I mm -hmm. went like low, low, low. And now yeah. I'm charging higher. Yeah. And it's like the same kind of like internal fear you have to overcome. And I'll never forget. It was actually a coach that was helping me. And I was trying to go from, what was it at the time? I think it was like five to 10 K speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and I had never been paid 10 K at that point. And she was like, how much do you make speaking Daryl? And I was like, 5k. She was like, how much do you make speaking Daryl? I was like, 5k. She said, Daryl, how much do you make speaking? And I was like, oh, 10 K. <laughs> yeah. She nice. said, that's how easy it is. Yeah. The reason why you're not making 10 K is because you haven't quoted anybody. on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you, dude, like it didn't happen the next conversation, but within like a month or so I got 10 K to speak and it was all in my head. And so, you know, the, the early stages is like, you put the price out there, put a price mm -hmm. out there that you feel mm -hmm. comfortable with, that you feel is fair and get used to quoting a price. You don't have to start and do free, 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 free till you right. think you're good enough yeah. to get paid. If you can add value to the audience, you can get paid for that. That's it. 
yeah that's yeah. the main thing you know adding value to the audience a lot of early speakers might just go out and just tell their story they might just you know tell some facts or try and train people on something but but yeah thinking about how do i create value for the audience what can they take away for this and apply it to their lives that, mm-hmm. that's the big transformation isn't it yeah it is totally perfect and i guess one last question i wanted to just ask because this was really powerful is for anyone listening right now that's an aspiring speaker would love to get to where you are but maybe are just struggling they might be stuck what kind of advice would you give to them what what should they do right now to really take themselves to the next level identify why you're stuck what is the actual fear and do the opposite that the fear is telling you to do um so you know that's different for each every one of us Mm -hmm. um the other thing i would say is get a coach Yes. Right. Some coach that you feel like can help you, you can guide, you can hold you accountable, um, could even help you put together your story. Because sometimes the fear is not like an energetic, like I'm actually afraid. Sometimes it's just that um, I'm incompetent. Like, yeah. I just don't know. Mm-hmm. And if I could see like that, sometimes I do these story writing sessions with people and they'll see their story said in a way that's like, whoa. And then they get confident about it. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> you know, like yeah. it wasn't actually a fear. It was just like a incompetence thing. Mm-hmm. And so um, maybe, maybe that's a route for some people to get work with a writer to help write it out. And then you're like, oh man, okay, that is good. I do have stuff to say. And then that'll help you, you know, kind of overcome that, that hump to get out there. And yeah, a lot of what you said there might be, you know, come back to fear of, it might be imposter syndrome, fear of other people's yeah. opinions, fear of being yeah. judged, all of that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thanks for sharing that. that. So yeah. final promise, final question, I promise if somebody wants to book you as a speaker or find out more about you, where should they go to do that? They just go to my website or my social. So my website, DarylStinson.com or my socials at Stinson Speaks on every platform. Amazing. And what yeah. I'll do, Daryl, is I'll post a link to all of those in the show notes so people can just click on them and find out more. Of course. Yeah. Love it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming along today, sharing your story and, of course, providing such great value for our audience. Appreciate it. Thank you.